Do you we remember were on that a Learjet. I remember that night yeah. very, very yeah, well. because I'd never been on a I'd never been on a Learjet. Jet before. So they put us on a private jet to go to this thing, and I'm sitting next to Kiefer. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you've heard this about him, but he enjoys a drink or two every once in a while. <laughs> um, and, and he was enjoying a, a, a few beverages on, on the plane. How'd that go? I, well, we hit some turbulence. I'm nervous. And... The, I don't know if you remember that the plane must have dropped a thousand feet. I mean, it just went boom, and I'm I'm white knuckled on the seat, and Kiefer is sitting next to me like this, and he goes, la 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 bamba. Please welcome Daryl Maroney and Lou Diamond Phillips, Young Guns panel. You done well. How you doing? Really good. <laughs> I'm spitzing already. Well, I can see why. Yeah. There you go. Welcome. It's so great to have you guys. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You seem like such an interesting guy. I'm, I'm just supposed right. to say that. No, I know, but and, we and, are. And you look fabulous. That's I gotta what I say. Mean. I feel underdressed all of a sudden. Uh, Do you know him? Is it, no. Me neither. No. All right. He gives a really but everybody good first knows, impression. Everybody knows you guys, though. Like, and look, he owns a brush. You and I, we do not. Not so much. No. No. Okay. <laughs> so needless to say, it is so good to have you guys. Thank, and, thank you. Uh, first time in Pittsburgh visiting or uh, ever? No, I came here for the Van Halen show in 84. <laughs> So yeah, who was there? Nice. Nobody. So that's some Pittsburgh friends. <laughs> right I'm wondering there. if the pipe fitters didn't didn't roll through here uh, at some point. You know, I was with a you know a glorified garage band in the late '80s and early '90s. Oh yeah. Uh, what? No, it's it's all kind of a blur right now. So uh, I think you guys it, played a club called the Decade. If we I'm not. might have, and that might have started my uh, my uh, my my love for Yingling. You know. <laughs> So it is great to have you guys here. I got just a handful of questions for you. Turn it over to the audience. It's whatever you want to do, however you want to hang out. This is your time. Just uh, kick back and have at it. So happy to see Lou. Um, saw him once earlier this year. Uh, yeah, no, it's always wonderful, and you always look fantastic, and uh, you're always funny as hell. <laughs> you know. see, why, see why I'm happy to see Lou? <laughs> Obvious. So the cast of the movie is absolutely flawless. I mean, down to the, the smallest you know, character, it's flawless. What was the audition process like for you guys? Okay. Um, uh, okay, so the, the, this is one of my favorite stories, actually. This is one of yes. my first uh, Hollywood uh, uh, stories. Uh, by the way, I saw Casey! He's alive! I'm glad. I swear to God, I finally saw Casey. Casey Schmashko, Charlie yeah. Beaudry, my yes. partner in Young Guns. Yeah, yeah no, epic, I, was, I, was on a, I was on a red-eye flight from L.A. to New York. Oh, bless you. You know, I was just about to pull the covers up, and I heard this voice talking. Pull the covers up. Being, being very, very charming to, to the, uh, the flight attendant. And I thought, I know that voice. And I looked up, and sure as shit, it's, it's Casey Shamashka. Oh, well, get him out of here. So He's looking can, uh, great. Lo love on him for 3 o'clock high. Yeah, and all of that. The, I love him. Yeah, okay, so, um, so I get the call uh, to go in on a meeting at, at uh, 20th Century Fox. I read this script. I'm from Texas. It's a Western. I'm like, hello. <laughs> you know, uh, loving it from, from page one. Uh, but they do not send, uh, they usually tell you what sides you're supposed to, you know, audition with, you know, to read with. Um, and so, I, you know, I picked the big speech, and I think I picked one other scene, uh, and I prepared them. And then I, you know, drove down to 20th Century Fox, and there's John Fusco, the writer and the producer, Chris Kane, the director, um, Paul Schiff, and, and Joe, Joe Roth. Uh, so there's that whole panel. Uh, and and they're wonderful. They're being so nice and so warm. And I'm you know uh, I'm I'm new to Hollywood. You know I've done two films in Hollywood. Uh, he doesn't know enough to suspect them. When no, warm I don't. And nice. I don't. You know, but I had done La Bamba and Stand and Deliver. Those were my first two films. Yes. And this was the first third. two movies. Can you believe it? And Incredible. so now I'm, I'm meeting here on on uh, on Young Guns. And you know the meeting's going great, and then there's a lull in the conversation, 
And I go, uh, okay, so uh, I'm so sorry. They didn't tell me what, what scenes to prepare, but I, I prepared a, a couple of them if, if uh, I, I hope these are gonna be okay. And Chris Kane looks at me, and he, and he looks at Joe Roth, and he looks at you know Paul Schiff and, and, and Fusco, and they're all kind of smirking. And I'm thinking, well, is what I said funny? I, you know? Uh, and, and then Chris kind of leans forward and he goes, um, Lou, um, the role's yours if you want it. <laughs> and I was like, um, well, okay then. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Wow. First, first time. First time that it ever happened to me. So uh, that, was, that was kind of a milestone for me. Can I just drop it in in case it doesn't come back up? I have a 10th grader now in city public schools in LA who just watched Stand and Deliver in their class over the course of two days. So that was so meaningful to me that your work as a student is inspiring my student now. It, just the full of it was, is, is amazing to me and I have you to thank. Oh, did, did he get the tattoos across the knuckles yet? Mm, no, we're hoping no, maybe <laughs> okay. just the piercing. Okay, I'm not sure I'll get out without any tattoos though. So the, the audition, uh, for you. Well, my story's similar. It sounds like then that that movie wow. was already from the very beginning in the hands of people who were creatively confident, knew what they saw. I didn't even have this track record with two stunning, you know, uh, almost with the uh, nomination in Stand and Deliver, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I was really coming from nowhere. But I'd done one movie for a studio. It was called Sunset. Does anybody ever remember that one? James Garner and Bruce Willis was on Moon Moonlighting. Wow. But on his, uh, what you call hiatus, he came in and he plays the 1920s cowboy movie star. And Garner plays uh, like Doc Holliday to come in, that's the technician. So it's the two worlds and incredible um, cast directed by the great Blake Edwards. Oh, jeez. Of Victor Victoria, all the Pink Panther movies, et cetera. So and you don't know who that is, go do your, go do your homework. But... Um, they used to have a thing called a telephone, and it had a cable that went to a little thing that's on your desk that has a dial. It's hard to explain. But they used that. Wow. And they could talk to each other without being in the same room. Uh. Crazy. Right. And Blake Edwards said to Christopher Kane, the quote that came to me was, hire Mulroney wow. before somebody else did. You'll be, you'll be sorry if you don't. So I got that part too without auditioning. I was out of town on a movie and I heard about it. I read the script, if I'm not mistaken, Dirty Steve was kind of written as a big guy. Yep. Or I had that impression in my mind. I remember trying to work on that wardrobe, trying to look as thick and kind of thicker than I am as possible. Um, so I didn't think I, yeah. You're I almost still couldn't very believe svelte. It. You're still I know very I svelte. still build all of that weight into my suits. <laughs> no, no, but conversely, they still have me taking my shirt off. Lou, when was the last time you, I mean, come on. <laughs> last time I took my shirt off? In a movie. I don't mean with your wife or whatever. Well, I, I, you know, it's interesting. See, it's um, been a while, right? No, I'm still on the court. No, I, the I, I, this summer, this summer I took my shirt off for a movie. Uh, yeah, no, it wow. doesn't, doesn't look like Courage Under Fire. I hear them all saying, me. wow, it's a, what it's movie? This is, you know, it's, 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 it's a Why guy with some... Why is it saying what movie it yeah. was that he took his shirt off in? Yeah. We'll, we'll see what the angles, hopefully the angles help me a little bit. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, maybe yeah. not directly from We're the side. Not, not such young guns anymore. <laughs> maybe not in profile. Yeah. Is that cool if I'm just like and, three you know, corner and not breathing? Speaking of young buns, um, gra gra gravity works, guys. Gravity works. Things start going south on you. And I don't mean New Mexico. <laughs> old, me. old Mexico, as we called it in the movie. Old, old Mexico. Mexico. So, Dermot, real quick, you mentioned uh, basically a reference from Blake Edwards for this movie. What was he like to work with as a director? He seemed yeah. to be not from the same cloth as other directors. No, and very much maybe even not of that same era. So I met him not the end of his career. He went on to make a few more movies after that, but uh, after some of his bigger successes. Um, he, he was very old school, literally like if he had a megaphone and a beret, um, you could kind of picture it. I remember my first day, unbelievably, it's maybe five years after Clockwork Orange, you have to put it in context. There's Malcolm McDowell, I play his son. He was the um, chaplain type head of the studio in the 20s around this story. Um, so I'm uh, in awe of that actor and then it's a th Again, it's hard to explain these things from the past. It's called a golf cart. And it came right up to the set. And a man stepped off the golf cart 
And they began shooting their movie. And that man was Blake Edwards. So it's the first time I'd seen somebody like delivered somewhere. On Literally a arrive golf on a cart. golf cart. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I didn't know. I've never seen a golf cart like being used to take somebody somewhere other than like next tee. I don't know. I just had the impression like a big moment where the big old timey director steps out of the golf cart and then starts directing Malcolm McDowell. So days like that. And like every day on Young Guns, you just don't forget. Um, so it drives a lot of actors crazy, but we did okay. So uh, at being this kind of cast, this kind of movie, the premiere had to be a riot. What was the premiere of the movie like? <laughs> oh, was that good? I'm not really pulling that It was that, that good. I, I'm not pulling that. I know what they did. That clip, Lou and I just had a little view of it. I haven't seen it played through. That trailer, Lou commented too. We both remember it was the very first day of filming. The first day before filming, it was a camera test, but what they were shooting was the trailer. So while we're still shooting Young Guns, this has never been done before, in that room full of confident men that you discussed, put this trailer in the theaters while we're still on the ground shooting. We're not even finished with the movie yet. That very trailer. Yes. Frame for frame. That so was the very first day of shooting. All that of racing shooting. camera and racing in. And, and what was amazing about it, because they had set a release date in June, and we were shooting the movie in January, so they wanted to get the trailer into the theaters as early as you know February. So it was yeah it, it was it was crazy. Uh, it kind of uh, changed the calendar in Hollywood somewhat. The same way yeah. you know digital filming speed, yeah. sped things up. It shrunk those windows. It also they did something else genius, which is why so many of us enjoyed Young Guns at Home over and over again on that VHS. Yes, it's because they released that like. You can't even think of it now. They did day and date, video on demand. Oh, you might find one theater in New York or something. That was earth shattering that they put the VHS out about three weeks later. The movie was still in the theater. So they overlapped both ends of that release in a way no one had done. So it was kind of innovative, kind of boring, really. But you know what I mean? They did things a little differently that made that movie yeah. pop up the way it did. So you don't remember much about the premiere then? I can't pull the premiere. Oh, what I was, was going to say is they, they flew us to um, Century City one night while we were shooting to see this trailer at a um, you know an executive oh, okay. function type of thing. Do you we remember were on that a Learjet. night? I remember that night yeah. very very yeah, well because I'd never been on a I'd never been on a Learjet jet before. So they put us on a private jet to go to this thing, and I'm sitting next to Kiefer. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you've heard this about him, but he enjoys a drink or two every once in a while. <laughs> Um, and, and he was enjoying a, a, a few beverages on, on the plane. How'd that go? I, well, we hit some turbulence. I'm nervous. And the, I don't know if you remember, the, the plane must have dropped a thousand feet. I mean, it just went, whoom! And I'm, I'm white-knuckled on the seat, and Kiefer is sitting next to me like this, and he goes, la, 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 la. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't even remember that. Uh, no. No. <sighs> Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Bro. So with that kind of energy on the set, how difficult was it for uh, the director, uh, Christopher Kane to handle okay, something? Okay, but let me tell you, me, okay, okay, my okay, flying, okay. flying with Kiefer's story. Okay, please. Because it happened before this one. <laughs> it's on the way to Santa Fe. I had been riding with him. We were training, me and Casey and, and Kiefer in California. Other guys did their riding elsewhere to prepare to meet. In, in, so we're flying to New Mexico. Find myself next to him. <laughs> we're both drinking. Uh, and, and he winds up telling me that you have no idea. He says, you have no idea the life I've led. This is, he's fucking 21. Right? <laughs> but think about it this way. I'm much older. I'm like 23 and a half. Yes. And I'm taking offense. There's a 21-year-old kid sitting next to me telling me how I wouldn't understand how tough his life has been. So that's how that started for me and Kiefer. I was like, I know a thing or two. I'm 20. I'm almost 24. Show him. Uh, we were pretty rambunctious. Um, and they, after, after about a week and a half, I think it was, uh, they, 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 they decided to stop letting us ride our horses to the set. Because, you know, in a, in a Western, 
you know, you, got, you want these big, you know, uh, uh, horizons, these large expanses. So they, they could never, they could never park the, the trailers and all the, the equipment trucks and everything close. So we were always like a mile away from base camp. And we had gotten into the habit of getting on our horses. Jack Lilly used to let us do it. And, and riding, you know, hell bent for leather, uh, you know, to the set. And then, you know, after, after about a week and a half, they, they realized that it probably wasn't such a good idea to let yeah, us do in that. In truth, we did all our own writing. Yeah. All of it. I don't believe we were doubled for a thing. Very rarely. Wow. Unless there's something. No, I'm... Um, uh, there's no sequence. Uh, not, not Young Guns 2. I know that was different. Yeah, no, but Everett, you know, the thing that I remember... And worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, bro. Yeah. Right. Lou was in them both. Which is better? Oh, never mind. Yeah. It's better to be in both movies. Never mind. There's that. Uh, but, you know, Everett, Everett Creech did hire... Uh, it had been like the first Western that had been made in Santa Fe in like decades. So Everett, Everett Creech, um, God bless him, hired a bunch of like retired stuntmen. And all of us ended up okay we, we must have put a half a dozen stuntmen into the hospital because those guys hadn't been on a horse in a while. Yeah. yeah. So you, we work with some veteran actors on there, right? Brian Keith, Terrence Stamp. Uh, Jack Palance. Jack Palance. Yeah. What was it like working with them? Well, what do you reckon? Somebody, uh, somebody text their Googler right now and have them Google it and text them back and find out like how old is Jack Palance when we worked with him and how far back did he start? Right, so would he have been an actor in the 30s when we're working with him in the 80s? Right, so that's how I think about that. So it takes our roots all the way back to the start of the century, yeah, right? No, I, because we're working with the old guy when we were young. And they, and they just totally legitimized you know, the film. I mean, to, to have them in the movie. I mean, like Brian Keith, uh, first morning I get in the van uh, uh, to work with Brian Keith, and, and, he, and he literally turns around to me and he goes, who's the military man in your family? And I want my dad. And he goes, I drank with Lou Diamond in a bar in Tokyo in 1948. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, with well, my namesake. I'm named for a World War II uh, hero of the Pacific Theater, Gunnery Sergeant Lou Diamond. And Brian Keith and Jack Warden both told me the same story. Apparently, wow. apparently in 1948, uh, Lou Diamond would let people buy him drinks in Tokyo. So uh, uh, I remember that. And then the, f the first day uh, Mr. Palance came to set, uh, it used to take us, what, like a half an hour to get propped up because we had all these guns and all these straps and all these pouches and things that we you know, had on us. So it would take a long time to get, to get propped up every morning. And I was in the middle of getting propped up, Peter Bankins, and uh, that's right. Um, and, and Mr. Palance comes, and he's going to choose a gun. That's all he has to do is choose his gun. And so uh, uh, Bankins looks at me, and I look at Bankins, and I, look, I step back, and I let Mr. Palance go. And, and, you know, he takes his time choosing his gun. You know, and like 20 minutes later, after he's, you know, <laughs> gone through all of this, blah, blah, blah. And I've stood off to the side very quietly. And uh, now I can step forward and finish propping up. And I, and I say to him, you know, I, I, I go into the two-minute spiel of, you know, gushing and, oh, my God, you're a legend, you're an icon, it's such an honor to work with you, oh, blah, 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 blah. And at the end of my whole spiel, Jack Palance looks at me and goes, yes. <laughs> and walks off. <laughs> this, is, this, this is what I remember about Jack Palance is they get him all propped up and walk him slowly out to the set, they get him up on his horse, he'd say his one line, regulars, go, go straight to hell, right? right? Some big performance, and then they'd get him off his horse and then walk him to his car. And that was the end of his day. This is a veteran actor in the Western in the 80s. Now, cut to, how do you do when you gotta get on a horse? Do you, you, you walk over to the horse, you get up on, you say your one line, they take you down off the horse and they let you go for the day. So we're, we're doing like balance now. Yeah. Turns out it's like a natural evolution. <laughs> I'm when, just reading the sitting in the saddle, but not actually reaching the not actually riding a horse era. Yeah, where you sit, sit there and say your lines. Horse. Yeah, yeah, with the step ladder. With the step ladder. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and just one more question before we turn it over to the audience: uh, When did you know this film was going to go through the roof? At what point of you being in this film was like this is this thing is huge? 
Well, Lou referenced Young Buns. This movie got, it's so funny. Well, you got to put it in the time of the context at the time. This is right when youth cinema exploded. They hadn't made a movie with a teenager in it since Rebel Without a Cause before John Hughes broke with Breakfast Club, blah, 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 and Ferris Bueller, blah, 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 right? So there was a brand new industry. The oldies in Hollywood were not happy about it, right? They still wanted fucking Spencer Tracy to be in, the fr in front of their movies, right? So this was a huge seismic shift because what happened in the meantime, all those pretty boys, have you seen Outsiders recently? So brilliant, so beautiful. That was the quality of Hollywood's young men right there. Literally like golden boys. So their thought of turning that into a Western, we got ridiculed that they were gonna make pretty boy, uh, what were they calling it, Brat The Brat Pack Western. Western, yeah. So we fucking showed them, didn't we, huh? <laughs> Fuck you. All right, but it was legitimized right out of the yeah. gate. You asked that question. To, to, uh, somewhat not to our surprise, we worked so hard and we wanted that to happen, and then it did. So we showed them right away that they were wrong, that we, yeah. when I say pretty boys, I mean them yeah. and me, um, but uh, and not so much Lou. But. <laughs> I have good hair. Uh, no, the first time I was, was seeing that trailer in, in a movie Your hair got its own applause. Thank you. Yeah. Should we just take a moment for Lou's Thank you. That's very satisfying. Thank you. Yeah, no, the first time I saw uh, the trailer in a theater with a real audience uh, that didn't know I was there, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, the response was palpable. It was like, whoa! I, I actually heard somebody say, everybody's in this one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's grab some questions. Hi, guys. Hi, how's it going? Um, what, if anything, did you take from the set, and do you still have it? <laughs> I took a hat and a vest, that leather vest that I wore. I still have that. The hat I kept for a long time, and it wasn't the first hat. It was like the, the doubles hat uh, or, the, you know, the stand-ins hat. Yeah. Um, and just last month, I picked it up, and the brim fell away from the hat. It had been moth-eaten around the hat because Jeffrey Ouch. Blake sent me a picture of his hat. Oh, wow. He still has it. Oh, nice. Uh, I took the costume that I got shot in, and it still has the blood stains. Wow. You still uh, have it's, it? Yeah, it, I still have it. It's in plastic in the garage. <laughs> it's in plastic yeah. in the garage. I also took one of the Bowie knives that had the rings on it, but I gave that to Mo Dunster, God rest him, uh, Kiefer's assistant, who gave it to his son. So, yeah. All right, next question. I, I was just wondering, Mr. Mulrooney, how you handled all that chewing tobacco while you're yeah. filming. Sorry about that, everybody. I didn't know um, that you know, like being a bad role model was really a thing. Um, so anyone who picked up uh, Copenhagen in '88, my bad. Um, but I gotta say, the bridge looks fantastic. <laughs> but the bridge really looks good. Uh, there. Um, no, I still have most of my teeth. Uh, and it led to a terrible uh, tobacco habit that I had to get rid of, uh, you know, a dozen years later or something. But I was from Virginia. I was already dipping. Um, so when I got that part, I, I put it in there. I don't think it was in the script necessarily. No, I don't think it was, actually. Um, but that was, um, God, how inappropriate now is that? That was Red Man, <laughs> the tobacco. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> yeah. The Monongahela, we are here on your sacred ground. Thank you. All right. Well, for real. Coming up next, what do we got? If you could space the questions out so Kyle can run back and forth. Got to get his steps The in. longest That's distance it. he needs Let's to get go, steps Go, Kyle, in. go. Um, my question is for Lou. Um, I'm curious, what movie did you really enjoy doing the most? Young Guns or Renegades? Wow. Uh, I enjoyed Renegades because of Young Guns. Uh, the, 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 um, the two Young Guns films are probably the most fun I've ever had on a set. Uh, and I've said this many, many times, we were really, really fortunate that neither TMZ nor camera phones existed at that time. Uh, certain uh, statutes of limitation have not run out in New Mexico, so I, I can't say and talk about certain things. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, we, I, come on, I mean, we, we were the age we were, out in the middle of nowhere, making a Western, and just, just being, you know, young men full of, you know, full of piss and vinegar. 
you know. Um, and the only time that, that I've been on a set that even sort of approached that uh, level of camaraderie and fun was a, a thing I did called The Big Hit, which was, yeah, just, just a crazy, you know, comedy, ridiculous, you know, no, no rules kind of, kind of show, so, yeah. Trace me. It's all about love, baby. <laughs> I'm going to bust some caps. <laughs> All right, what do we have next? <laughs> Way up in the front. Yay. Uh, of course. Come, come on, step it up, Kyle. Step it up. Nice. Don't pull a hammy. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, so my sister and I, we both like wore our VHS tapes out of Young Guns 1 and 2. Um, but <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I was a Christian Slater, like, 14, 15, anything he was in, I was there. Anyway, um, so you had said about, like, that trailer being, like, not even filming yet, just testing cameras. How much shooting, like, how much practice did you guys have to go through? Did you have like anybody like stand in and like teach you or do it for you? Um, no, they were they were really great prop guys. Yeah. You even remember his name. Yeah. And um we Jack Lilly. We we had about a week's worth of cowboy camp. Yeah. Uh, you know, where, where we got to go, you know, to the range and shoot guns. Some of that, too, is sort of designing where he's going to hang his knife. And so we were, yeah. you know, the scabbard on the back where I had that yeah. sawed off shotgun. Uh, you yeah. say that prop guy's name again, Peter. Peter uh, Bankins. He made that because I said, what if? And then before you know it, it's like yeah. this iconic thing. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Above the hat on the, in the saddle instead of being out of the picture. This is, this is the beauty of, of being on a feature film. Uh, th things move so fast now. And. Uh, I always appreciate a good director or producer who builds in this time. Uh, but, you know, the, the rings on the Bowie knife, I requested that before we ever got to set. And, and the prop guy was able to make it just like he made your scabbard. Um, they, they sent me throwing knives so that I, I had a month to practice at my home. I set up a, a target in the backyard and do all of that. And then once we got there, we, you know, we, they, they had all the horses there for us. And uh, did a did a cowboy camp, and you know you know Derm, like Dermot said, uh, he was training with you know Kiefer. I had a guy named uh, Dale Gibson, who's a, who's still a good friend. I've done like three or four films with Dale uh, Longmire. Actually, uh, Dale doubled me a few times on that. But he was a a, a, a a trick writer from Kentucky, and he taught me how to hang off the horse and do it all that crazy stuff. Uh, uh, so he was there, and, and we, you know, we got a lot of work in. So uh, it was just one of those um, situations that by the, first, by, the, by the first day of filming, we'd all had a chance to bond and work and, and get really, really comfortable with, with everything that we had to do. And fight with Kiefer. <laughs> no, we you really remarkably, exactly, really remarkably, um, yeah. At that age, there was no conflict. The whole thing was incredible. No, and we we were that way today. Actually, yeah, he actually got on very, very well from the beginning. Nice. All right, let's grab a few more questions. You I'll guys ask are headed mine back in a minute. <laughs> I'm talk to mine. Yeah, heading back to the table after this. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, I love both both of your work, um, Lou. You know, La Bamba was one of my very, very favorite. You know, when it first came out, I mean, that was just. How much preparation did you have, you know, for Richie Valens that you had to go back? And then also, Dorma, I do have a question for you afterward. Uh, the, um, a lot of people say, did you, did you love doing La Bamba? I, I did, but I'll be really honest. I was scared shitless every single day. I was cast for La Bamba uh, after they did a national talent search and saw 600 people. I was cast on the Friday before they started rehearsals on Monday. I had five days five days to uh, learn 16 songs. I don't play the guitar to learn all the fingering. Um, they, they put me on a, a, a five meal a day diet because they wanted me to put on 10 pounds. I was a skinny dude back then. Um, and rehearsals, you know, for, for 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, and, and a stack of, uh, you know, material written about the day the music died that was this big. So it was... Um, it was total immersion, not to mention the fact that I got very, very, very close to the family. Uh, you know, uh, the real Bob Morales and, and his mom, Connie, and the sisters, Connie and Irma, little Mario, who was just a baby at the time. Um, 
So it was, it was really a trial by fire. And literally on the, the third day, Taylor Hackford, who's an intimidating dude, uh, Taylor literally said to me, you know, you don't knock this out of the park, kid. We're going to send you back to Texas. And so, yeah, every single day I was, I was in fear of getting fired. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lot of pressure. So uh, one other question about La Bamba. I was always curious. There was another performer, Chan Romero, who actually followed in uh, Richie Valens' footsteps. He was very close with the family. He had, did he have anything to do with that movie? I, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't recall meeting Chan. Uh, I, I got very close with the family. Uh, Bob Keen uh, actually came by the set you know, a few times. And uh, 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 I, I think they were as kind to Bob in the script as they were because he was so involved. Uh, I understand he was kind of like one of those managers from the 50s, not the greatest of guys. But, uh, um, yeah, the, the, there were, you know, cousins and aunts and, you know, other, other musicians and whatnot that, that uh, uh, kind of went through that, that period with everybody. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing to be reminded almost on a daily basis that this is really about somebody's life. Mm -hmm. and, and that adds that much more pressure to getting the performance right. You, you owe, I think, the, the real-life people who live that uh, your, your, your honesty and your respect. Great. Uh, let's and grab a few more questions. Yeah. Uh, one more for yeah. Dermot. Oh, no uh, August Osage County, I mean, that, that's yes. one of my favorite. Uh, that dinner scene, yeah. how many times did you have to shoot that, especially with Merle Street? Yeah, uh, thank you. That's one of the high points of, in terms of like script acting and actors in a scene that I've ever had. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning play, it's Tracy Letts. Um, and that scene as written in the play is um, about 22 to 25 minutes long. And they wrote the screenplay word for word. So it was gonna run about 20 minutes. It might be a little faster in the, in the film itself. So they set aside four days to shoot that, but the cast had already rehearsed it together. So if you can picture, we had several potluck dinners at Meryl Streep's condo in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, um, and uh, sat around the table with the whole cast two nights in a row. Well, I got to watch her do this tour de force scene. Catches in my throat to think about the privilege of being there. Um, so we were really well prepared, and we shot it in like three days and finished before lunch on the fourth day because she and Julia and everyone else was perfect every time. It's that rehearsal that you talked about. We had that, or we forced that up, did that for ourselves. Um, so after we're done shooting, I'm in post-production with John Wells, who directed it so beautifully, and said, how did you do it? I was there, I saw every one of those takes of hers. How did you pick the best one? They were all different, and they were all perfect. So how do you not put four versions of that scene in the movie? And he said, believe it or not, there's Every one, there's a choice that makes it just that, just noticeably better. He said there was a choice every time. But anyway, that was, thank you for just reminding me of that. Those couple of days were towering in my, like, acting scape through, through, through life. And, to, and yeah, to, to um, honor that story where it took place. We shot it in that town where it was set, et cetera. So amazing. Thank you. All right, two quick questions, and they're going to be headed back to do some more signing. Yeah, Mr. Mulroney, um, yeah, the most recent Scream movie, when your spoiler alert revealed to be the, the villain. You yeah. Like what? <laughs> yeah, no. I know. I'm sorry. I said spoiler alert. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, Lou. <laughs> you, oh, well. You, you said you just spoiler lost us alert 10 bucks. and then didn't give me a chance to put my hands over my oh, ears. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you look like yeah. You're, you're having just the best time. <laughs> I am. Playing the villain. Was that fun? Well, they, they called me up, Lou, and they put me in Scream 6, so... I just looked at that night. I looked at Scream One. I was like, I, I know what, I know what to do. I just have to lose my shit in the last reel, right? And so you read the script, and it's all in there. And so all of that humor, we did a really wide range in that performance, as per the directors who let me go here or, or tighten me up there. And so that performance is very much mine, but it's so much theirs. And the editor, um, thank you. But I mean, the way they piece that together. It could have gone a number of ways. So they got to choose exactly how Scream to make it. Um, and I love the way they cut it together. If I was going to do, I had to take that one thing out. <laughs> um, have you ever seen yourself in a movie and wished that it was, ex that, that, that you, and then, and that you wouldn't change a thing? 
there, you know, there's some that I've been really happy with. There are others that I look at and go, oh, 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 what was I thinking? You know. Young Guns might be one of those for me, where I really don't think there's any mistakes in it. Nobody yeah. did any bad acting no, or anything. No. Um, no. But that's what we're always on alert to avoid, in case you didn't know we don't want to be bad at it. <laughs> or get caught. Or get caught being bad at it. So then you have, what you do is you work with great people like Lou and Meryl Streep, and guess what? <laughs> they fall for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and final question, please. Hi. I just got the new 4K restoration of Young Guns that just came out yeah. this past week. And uh, there's a good featurette on there where, Lou, you talk about um, learning how to ride the horses. And <laughs> just in case anybody hasn't heard that interview yet, I wondered if you could tell the story about how Charlie Sheen <laughs> had some <laughs> trouble with the horses. Um. <laughs> Quickly, all right. right. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, we, all, we all trained. Charlie did not train. Charlie's indoorsy. Yeah. Just, you, you know, I have to ride a horse. Uh, okay, whatever. You know. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah. Right. So. So. And and he 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 came up. My my wife at the time, Julie Seifer, was a a a, a, a a PA on it. She came up with a little trick for him. She they 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 came up with the Charlie strap. Where he could hold on, hold on to the saddle and look kind of cool, but he was holding on, you know, for dear life the entire time. So we have this one scene where literally they got like six cameras, and this was—I mean—one of Chris Kane's first directions to us was, "Don't think too much." Uh, he really wanted it raw. He wanted it off the cuff. He didn't want it cerebral in, 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 at all. He really, you know, he wanted us to use that that young male energy that we had. So the the one scene right after uh, Emilio shoots our first AD <laughs> in the toilet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and then then all the bad guys come busting out of this you know uh, uh, shed bar in the middle of the woods. Uh, they literally, all they did was load it up every single one of, I mean, they wouldn't let us do this today. They ne No, they wouldn't even get close to letting us do this today. So they loaded up all of our guns, and Chris said, come in, shoot every blank that you have. If you have more than one gun, shoot everything. Doesn't matter where you shoot it, stunt guys are going to be falling down left and right. So, literally, and six cameras, and he, he just wanted the chaos. I can't believe we didn't shoot each other in the damn head. Uh, Lou, I got news for you. I got a wad right in the back yeah. of the net from Kiefer. So, yeah, yeah okay. we did so, shoot each other in the head. There you go. That's so part of the story is, he forgot. But, but this was the plan. Yeah. No, I had one go through my hair, too, from that damn <laughs> buffalo gun of his. So this would be the little paper piece of the... Yeah, uh, of the... The wadding. Uh, of the blank. But as we know, that can even be lethal, so... It can be. So it's amazing none of us got hurt more. So at any rate, I empty my guns, Kiefer empties, and we're the first two out. So broom, 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 we're riding away Rookies. from the set. And Shoot slower, yeah. stay in right? the scene longer. I know, well, we didn't, we shot quick. Uh, don't let that get around. Um, so Kiefer and I are riding out, you know, yeah, I think that went okay, yeah, that went pretty good, yeah, don't you think? And then between the two of us, like a freaking greased lightning bolt comes Charlie. His horse is 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 bolting. Like, bolting. Yeah. He's Charlie's not in of it. boots are up around the horse's head <laughs> like this. He is leaned back, completely prone on the horse, screaming, Whoa fuck whoa <laughs> And immediately on his heels are two stunt guys going after, and they're trying, they, they finally, you know, like, you know, yeah, stop the horse. The yeah. But yeah, but yes, <laughs> that is, so bad. that's all I saw. I was, whoa, fuck, wow! <laughs> that's a good note to end on. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't think we can top that. Give it up, young guys, oh, put up! You know you want to hang out with these guys. They're going to go back to their Thank table. Good night, Phelps. Over the road, hey. You can do better than that. Come on, it's these guys. Hey there, this is Nolan North, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Good for you. Very proud of you. Now go watch more. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom. I like that.